thanks very much for the kind introduction. Thanks also for everyone joining and watching online. For us, it's uh, very satisfactory to see that we have lots of uh, participants. Yeah. So uh, Rainer has already uh, mentioned the title. Today, we're going to pursue the question whether we can teach a machine catalyst uh, discovery. And we're going in high throughput simulation, and that is both on the experimentation and on the simulation side. Yeah. And we will see what AI can do for us. So let me explain a bit what, what we're going to do today. We're going to take you on a journey. That's a bit the idea. And first of all, we're going to speak about paradigm changes in science. And then we're going to speak about something which from our point of view is a very large paradigm change. And that is mainly AI driven research. Um, and we're going to go through two case studies. In the first one, we will take first steps and see what we can do in AI and data-driven research. And in the second study, we will really try to approach also relevant targets with regards to the sustainability goals in this case of BSF. And then we'll hold our closing remarks. If you do not see our pictures, you can always see our small avatar, so you always know who's speaking. And with this, I give to Sandip and Sandip. Uh... Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, thank you, Rainer, for the kind introduction. Uh, before we dive into uh, the actual AI and other uh, more detailed topic, maybe it is a good time to set the context correct. And let's step back and see how we have been doing science. So most of the science um, originally is, you can say, empirical experimental science, where we have been trying to do uh, and different uh, you know trial and error based experiment and each change of the paradigms we have been empowering ourselves with new ways of cutting down experiments so first with model based theoretical science then computational science and now it has been argued that we are at the fourth paradigm where uh, we are doing big data driven science what does that mean is with the traditional approach uh, where science is always data driven um, compared to that, what is different in the big data driven is it is not um, meant to that you use only your data, but it's a more of a community approach so that you don't start always from the scratch when you are doing your research, but you utilize what is out there. Uh, and that kind of uh, changes uh, the challenges and increases the scale because now the scale of the data and the information what is available that is huge and it is humanly impossible for uh, someone or a small group of people to to take advantage of that data without additional help and that's where the AI and the data science comes into pictures and the workflows of how you take the data analyze them, build features and build different models start becoming, uh, the interplay of them start becoming very important and it becomes more uh, uh, agile way of doing things, uh, how you do research. So the expectations of from the AI and data-driven research is kind of uh, the evergreen uh, expectation, nothing new. We want to go towards goal much faster, more efficiently. We want to find what is the you know the uh, the interesting uh, areas to explore and uh, with the hope that you just don't do a uh, understanding of a problem in a in a retrospective but how you can develop an understanding in a way which leads to some actionable insights and where you can steer the development in the right direction uh, to give you kind of some specific uh, cases, uh, it's about you know identifying opportunity by pattern. So on the left, you see a traditional uh, hit, uh, you know catalysis uh, volcano plot where you can you can see uh, one moment. Uh, there is some yeah okay. So we, we see that. Um, how you can identify that which regions of a descriptor space would be interesting, which is the two-dimensional plot on the right. It's the similar motivation, but we are dealing with much more complex structural data where machine-generated interactive maps can be used to understand structure property relationship. And then the second um, you know, motivation could be like finding gaps. If you take the inspirations of the first version of periodic table, when people uh, knew that there are some, some gaps and that if the gap exists, there must be some elements there. And that kind of creates a motivation that uh, encouraged motivation to look for what exists out there. On the right, it is similar kind of concept of, the, of a map 
of uh, all the known databases of silicon where you know this this uh, this outlined uh, uh, areas are the known phases and the and the and the empty spaces are where there are opportunity lies where theoretical uh, different uh, uh, um, promise was made and the, and the, uh, yeah some of them was also synthesized experimentally now with this i give back to stefan where he would take us to some experimental example so when we originally started to discuss about the field and where this is going we kind of like said hey um, I mean, this is a new scene. This is a, a time of paradigm change. How can we basically find a case which is attractive to enter in this field? And the case that we alluded originally to was basically set in the field of partial oxidation catalysis. And there's one specificity to partial oxidation catalysis, specifically for alkanes, but also for olefinics. That is basically that you mostly have complex oxides which contain vanadium. But we found a, a new um, materials class which differentiated from that and we basically said this materials class we believe would enable us to step outside of the box to non-vanadium containing materials which would potentially also obey new rules and we could basically check out uh, whether those rules uh, were in parallel to what was already known or whether they would be really new rules and that was why we basically jumped to platinum group metals in selective oxidation. And this is a bit of a paradigm because platinum metals are usually used in exhaust catalysis for their largely oxidizing properties. But it was known that in homogeneous catalysis, you could use them to produce methanol from uh, methane, basically, in a single step activation. So we had first approaches, basically, where um, such catalysts could be heterogenized. But the real step change basically came when we discovered a new structure. And that was the rhenium trioxide structure composed of tungsten and phosphorus containing materials. And this allowed us basically to include several PGMs on positions which were normally held by tungsten. And we basically found a very effective way of preparing such catalysts in a high throughput manner by a very simple technique called incipient wetness or so using a support um, applying the EDAC components. And that was uh, also allowed us for a very straightforward addition of promoters. With this, we basically went forward and made very stringent test campaigns. And here is where high throughput experimentation coupled in greatly because the first study that we went on was a study with over 100 catalysts, very systematic with regards to reaction conditions and also compositions. And this basically gave us a first view. And what you can already see on the left-hand graph, there's only a very, very small area which gives you the highly selective catalyst. So the question was, which were the rules which apply to these catalysts and would bring this forward? Right. So from the experiment, we could find out that which uh, you know, the compositions are interesting for this, uh, you know, ternary oxide phase. But the question is, can we identify the rules and the, identify the rules in a way which would allow us to, you know, identify different other going beyond just these three component materials, but looking outside the box. And that uh, poses a, a little bit different kind of challenge in nature than what is usually faced in machine learning. Um, because now we are talking about there is a very small group of uh, uh, interesting compositions and we want to understand why they are important. We're just not just important finding them, but finding why they are important in a way that makes sense uh, to, to extend it to new materials. So the way we use it here, we use a algorithm called subgroup discovery, which was uh, developed uh, earlier uh, in, in FHI ecosystem. And the, the concept is simple. If I, without going into too much into the uh, experimental, uh, uh, in the in the you know the, uh, the conceptual details, it is about you come up with different uh, uh, definitions of how these groups are defined, and you make a, a quality function which checks how well these groups cover your your utility function and how 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 is the quality. And on the right hand side, you see a kind of a. Uh, the, uh, the spirit which, which describes that how these informations are, are measured. So if they are, uh, you know, the homogeneity of these clusters are ideal, so then you say that the Jensen-Shannon divergence are, are zero. If it starts to deviate, then it's, uh, it, it starts uh, to uh, go into higher number. And with this information, then we have a tool 
And now the question is, what kind of descriptors uh, you want to put in um, when you are doing this analysis? Uh, you cannot just use the, uh, the experimental parameters and the, um, and the, um, uh, the discrete compositions of the materials because that would not allow you to go beyond that mm -hmm. set of material. That's why it is important that you go to more fundamental level. And here we use the quantum mechanical descriptors of the atom property, like different uh, um, uh, valence orbitals, uh, electronic um, ionization potential, electronegativity, homolumo gaps, etc. And you see how the correlation look just to just to kind of demonstrate how how these uh, descriptors are looking, uh, and then what you do is you let the algorithm learn, and based on it looks at all these different descriptor space, a different kind of you know subgroup, how um, how. Uh, why the important and the promising components, uh, what they have in, in, in common basically. Mm -hmm. And with that, you could come up with certain uh, kind of well-defined rule with the algorithm and with our uh, uh, different kind of way of analysis, the quantum chemistry simulation. And, and then it is time to turn back to the existing data, what mm -hmm. is in the database. And you see, now that we know certain rules, what are the other uh, elements which make sense? Mm -hmm. And applying that to uh, in a subset of ICSD database, and with this all this knowledge, we could come up with what would be the potential uh, uh, elements which could, you could try as a promoter. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the concept now that uh, I mean, realize that it is not just important to identify those promoters, but it's important that how would you put them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is important to also talk about the compositions because yeah. otherwise it's a huge space again. Absolutely. It does not solve your problem. Yeah. Yeah. And there uh, with those, you know, the rules, what we have learned that allows you to go a little beyond that to define those mm -hmm. boundaries where then you can take and do some experiment and, yeah. uh, and see how, where we stand. And with that, I give back to Stefan where he will tell us where it looks like in the experiment. Mm -hmm. So you have already seen on the last slide, the graph that you base is basically here illustrated on the left, that through the choice that the machine made of promoters, we see an improvement here. Of course, if you look on the scale of the selectivity bar and the conversion bar, what you can already see, it's a small change, apparently. But let's look a bit more deeper into this. What you can see here on uh, especially on the upper right is that when you change now the target, when you change from propane to propylene, which is, of course, the much easier to activate molecule. It's a dramatic change. Basically, here, you don't only have an incremental selectivity change, but it's really a paradigm shift in selectivity. It's a highly selective oxidation catalyst that you produce that would never have been predicted up in issue. So this really proved to us with such an approach, we can really understand and comprehend new design rules by the machine, basically by using the machine. So let's let's boil this down to something which which is very relevant and dear to us. As BSF, we have a, a promise basically uh, with regards to our track records and goal in uh, what we call our carbon management program, which is largely designed to limit our GHG relevant emission. And our target is basically that uh, by um, 2030, we basically have a very important touch point for us uh, and, and intermediate uh, touch point basically then ends in 2050, which is the promise of net zero emissions, so to say. 2050, you may argue, is not so far, but in developing uh, engineering sciences, this, this is very far. So the question is, can we also apply now the technology that we have brought forward and help basically in, in bringing things forward for BSF, which help reaching those goals? So I would like to allude a little bit on uh, carbon capture and use here, and that is specifically the conversion of CO2 to methanol. So we have various process options. So we, we have basically process options which go from hydrogenation of uh, CO2 to form uh, uh, basically synthetic natural gas, then putting this into a steam reform and then do conventional methanol, which is a three-stage three process, not very attractive. We have an endothermic reaction in between. Then we have other systems like the dry reforming or the re reverse water gas shift, which would directly give us a syngas, which we could use in conventional methanol. But what, we, what would be very attractive is to have a direct option to convert carbon dioxide in the presence of hydrogen into methanol, a feedstock very valuable for the chemical industry. 
And our idea here was basically to go forward based on things that were already known and to start with the materials class, which was already known from the literature, namely indium oxides, and to ask ourselves the questions, can we use the same methodology that we have used before and explore new materials? Indium is a scarce and rare material, which is also quite expensive by the end of the day. So also here, we would like to optimize a bit and find a cheaper solution. Yeah? So again, here, we intended to combine simulations with high throughput experimentation. So very important for us in the, technical, uh, in the technical realization is catalyst cost compared to performance. So it was already known that if we dope immune, we can get higher in performance, but much higher in cost. And we basically saw our field of opportunity in basically going to different oxides and basically getting their IP and low cost materials. Yeah. So of course, to make those dope and materials in reality, this will cost more, but it does not, you know, stop us of exploring them in 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 uh, in silico yeah. experiments and try to understand why those dopants would make things better and take those learning to 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 design for new materials. Now, one of the important aspects which is different here from the previous example is this is much more challenging because we are not talking about a same kind of you know, catalyst class of problem, but we are kind of hoping that we'll go to a different class from indium. Mm -hmm. And that that's requires that we look a little bit more into details. Mm -hmm. So that requires uh, understanding how different surface looks, what kind of defect, mm. defect formation energy is there, which will act as an active site, and how the reaction networks and the different you know, in, uh, intermediates act with those surfaces. Mm. And on the right-hand side, what you see is we have studied the, uh, the effect of 14 different dopants and 12 different intermediates. And just to show you how those intermediates looks like, this is basically how different intermediates uh, adsorb on different surface active, mm. uh, 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 active sites. Now, with this information, uh, you can then, oh, after you identify that which are the parts, which uh, that the key parameters, which mm -hmm. might give you a selection criteria, rough selection criteria, then you again turn back to database, and there you quickly realize that database takes you somewhere, but then it does not take you all the way, because mm -hmm. you are kind of in an uncharted territory, and your key parameters not necessarily, unless you are completely lucky, it mm. not necessarily exists in the database. So you need to quickly compute. Mm. And that's where the high throughput simulation comes in, mm. where how quickly you compute, the quicker you compute, quicker you try different hypotheses, mm. and quicker you go basically towards uh, uh, you know the solutions by eliminating uh, from the large uh, uh, option space. Mm. And here on the right, you see a kind of a defect formation energy, in this case, uh, oxygen vacancy defects in different of these oxide materials, and how they are uh, you know, grouped together by, by different uh, um, ways and how they compare with India. Now, uh, here, another way, of course, to realize is uh, when you talk about these descriptors and the intermediates interaction, this is like a static picture. Mm. And you are, but the catalyst is a dynamic process. Uh, we take the static picture for high throughput mm. screening because, not because we, I mean, that's the best choice because mm. we don't have other ways. You cannot do a dynamic simulation mm. uh, for this large number of materials because quantum chemistry methods are expensive. And at the moment to describe these uh, processes, there are no other reliable mm. solution. And that's where we have a um, extensive effort going on in the direction of building machine learning force field, where you say you learn uh, the interatomic interactions from the existing data, mm. or you generate the data basically small, small, with small, basically uh, well-designed training set, and then that allows you to go to a huge system. For in the in the in the right side, we are talking, uh, we are showing uh, a nano cluster. We are not there in the terms of accuracy, but that's the that's the hope. It at least allows you to do it in a much faster way. And then it opens up a fantastic opportunity. Mm. Here you see a video where the CO2 to methanol, all the steps, how the CO2, uh, you know, acting with the oxygen vacancy and going to, going to the final product methanol, all these steps, what are extremely expensive to compute in the DFT, that has been computed with this machine learned force field, which are, uh, I mean, order of magnitude faster. Mm -hmm. And look at it. I mean, isn't wow. it so beautiful, That's really? Beautiful. <laughs> It's a Actually, thanks to Edwin, my postdoc, who have rendered this so beautifully. <laughs> and well, because of the time, let's go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, now back to Stefan. Yeah. 
I mean, the question is now, of course, with all of those materials proposals, how do we turn this into a reality? And that's basically where solid state chemistry comes into play in material sciences, which is more or less my field of expertise. So we basically broke this down into a structure map uh, with different, uh, let's say, elements and different structures. And we basically synthesized, like, let's say, a spearhead to see uh, where, where, where can we really contribute value. So we went for, for different mixed metal oxides, but we also allowed for diversity in the material space with supported materials and hybrid materials. So this was really a very creative exercise, but it took some time, yeah? I mean, doing the physical world also, also takes some time, okay. So, so what was really achieved? I already spoke about the indium oxide and dopants, but what we could really deliver were three generations of different kettles where we could dramatically decrease the cost and basically came pari pari and in the latest generation even beyond in performance. So what we really have shown here is that we have a strong synergy between theory and experiment and we have developed an agile way of interacting. Yeah? And so the benefits are really proven. So what's, what's really the basic message here? So in the past, we have basically gone forward with theory and experiment step by step, but mostly alone. If we join forces here, we can basically be much stronger. But what we really learned is that we, if we combine this with the highway of AI, this really brings us forward. Yeah. So and this brings us basically to the final question of our talk. Right. So... I see that we have actually quite some time, so we can you know, take some time to wrap up the, what we have learned today. So we have chosen these two examples from many of the examples, I mean, carefully, because it, it shows uh, first example where we showed that AI and data-driven research is, is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the AI is not there yet. To, to, it's not a black box that you put in and, you, and the catalyst will be discovered. But the present way of catalyst research is also not that. It is yeah. not realistic to say that you will wake up in the morning and discover something. It's a so, it's a combina it's, it's 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 a combination of uh, different types of effort, and the AI is a great partner in there. Uh, and then we have we have seen that how the workflows, uh, which are you know uh, the traditional automation coming up with the with the AI tools, actually have potential to go uh, a major step forward. Uh, and and that allows you to you know uh, enlarge the scope of the operation but where all these methods will develop i mean as an industrial you know environment you cannot do all the things it will mm. take time and that's why the academic and industrial collaborations are key in solving problems and that's where you will see that we are also collaborating with uh, yeah. so many industrial uh, academic partners uh, so we started with the question. So I think we, we owe our explanation to the audience. Uh, we have chose, we have given you some example, two example, and uh, I I think we should be honest and we should not leave you with the with the just an impression that everything was done quite automatically and mm -hmm. we are just there. It is not there. I mean, most of the you know the examples what you read, the first example was a little bit retrospectively done, but the next example what we chose, mm -hmm. I mean, that's where we tried to couple it really yeah. um, where by learning, taking learning from the previous example that is yeah. possible. Now it gave us more hope and that's why we are trying to couple it in a, in a kind of in a real time yeah. with the experiment. So today, uh, AI, uh, I see them as a very expert and reliable assistant. Mm. I mean, it allows you to do the, your job, some of it very, very fast, very reliably. Uh, and uh, if you think that is your definition of learning and that's that's your definition and that's mm. it is there. But I think, I feel ultimately, you know, it's like a student. Mm. When do you say that he, he have learned or she have learned it? If they are coming up with a new ideas in the in tomorrow where you can then you know get inspired that okay i did not think about that and that's where we hope that ai will go mm. that uh, it's a long way to go when we will you know the ai will surprise us but it's i think a, a you know path worth exploring absolutely and yeah. with with that uh, uh, it's time to acknowledge it is a huge collaborative effort and we have just mentioned few of the people who are directly related to the examples we have mm. we have mentioned today but it's a uh, um, 
uh, it, it's a whole community effort to, to reach, uh, to take us where we yeah. have here. Yeah. Also so, a cross community effort. It's, it, also, absolutely, absolutely. So with that, um, we, um, we end our talk um, and um, questions. Yes. So thank you very much, um, Sandeep and Stefan. This was very impressive for me huh, to hear about that. To be honest, in my former life, before I have uh, get an innovation manager, I studied chemistry. Therefore, this was very interesting for me to learn now after more than 20 years where I stopped to be a chemist about the development. Huh? In my time, this was just a little bit digging in the dark to talk about or work with catalysts. As you said, um, in, in, in the catalyst uh, field, you have some standard catalysts, like you talked about vanadium, where you know or you learned what type of uh, reaction you can uh, deal with. Huh? And here to finding new gaps and uh, thinking uh, further on. Huh? is um, very impressing. So from my side and the other side, I'm really a little bit relaxed that you, uh, Sandeep, uh, told us in your talk that waking up in the morning is not just to find a new catalyst. Huh? That's just relaxing again. Huh? I see this is a long way, huh, what you have done. And thank you very much to bring us on this journey huh, through catalyst development and uh, supporting this with AI. Huh? So um, I think uh, the auditorium, the audience is a little bit expressed or, or uh, really expressed as well. Huh? So you came very deep huh, in your technology with some examples. I think everybody have to dig um, a little bit to digest what you have told them. And um, maybe from my point of view, I'm interested. So uh, this was uh, AI used in chemistry, used uh, as a new way you explore to find new catalysts. Uh, can you think about other gaps we will still have in science uh, where you may use your uh, way of new thinking? Um well, I think the challenges and the gaps is there. Uh, the technology gaps are there, and there, intelligent people are working, you know, in academia yeah. and, and different uh, in, in AI domain. Not necessarily with the science, but you know, like uh, other because AI has a larger uh, domain of applicability. But I think specific to this catalyst question, um, one of the main uh, challenges we see in this data-driven research is this adaptation to the community. Okay. This is a new way of ah. thinking uh -huh. and. and uh, do you hear us properly? Yes, I, I hear you properly. Huh? Okay, all right. So it's a, it's a new way of thinking. You have to encourage yeah. the young researchers to share their data, mm -hmm. which people are, of course, protected about mm -hmm. traditionally. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a new culture, and there are a lot of NFDI CAT, for example, yeah. is, is working a lot on this direction. And then the second challenge, what we see is uh, uh, lack of skilled talented people. Uh, traditionally, there are a lot of, you know, talented chemists, there are uh, quite a few of talented mm. data science and, and AI, but to do this kind of research, you need a blend of both. Yeah. And that's where I think uh, institute like uh, like KIT, I mean, there we, we yeah. look towards uh, towards such institute where the new generations of uh, yeah. uh, scientists are trained with, with, with this in mind. Yeah. Uh, I go back. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I would also to shortly like to comment on this, uh, Rainer. Um, mm -hmm. So, so in the past, basically, when when all of the AI hype was started, uh, I, I, I think the, as with many hypes, uh, people believed that hey, let's just take AI, analyze the data, and then we're there. And and we find it's not the case. And and what you really need is a data awareness. And what we also need to be aware that usually in catalysis, it's not a big data field. Yeah. Right. But what we basically found is that if we couple high throughput approaches, both from the simulation side, powered by AI, and high throughput experimentation process, we can make it a big data field. And that's where the, the power of AI comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what, what, as Sandeep has pointed out, we really need to engage the community also more. And this is happening on different levels, because we will not propel this forward if it's not a joint effort between industry and academia. And that's why all of the efforts within NFDI are so important. What is done within the consortia of, as Sandeep has just mentioned, NFDI for CUT or FAIRMAT, where basically take care about uh, materials data and materials simulation. So, so, so we're really anxious to work and collaborate together. Also, we are in close contact with 
people from KIT and also other organizations. I mean, for the work we have mentioned here, we had no mentioning of KIT, but with other things, of course, we're working on very challenging topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, explanation. So I see that uh, Pietro has uh, taken his hand. Uh, do you have a question? Can you switch on your mic and... Um... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for the, for the interesting talk. Um, I, I, I have a couple of very quick questions and I'm wondering, mm -hmm. basically, in terms of tooling, how much of the tooling is developed in-house in the BSF to do this kind of data integration, data processing and uh, visualization modeling? And how much do, that, do you buy that in from, let's say, by acquisition or by product, uh, products like from Palantir or services from Palantir? A uh, second question would be like, what other industrial players, uh, where would you see yourself as an industrial player in, in combining your data science, let's say, research, like in research approach to generate new products? Would you say, see, you are like at the beginning when it comes to transforming BSF into a company that is really data integrated and data driven? Or would you say, well, let's say, where's your gold standard in there in the, in the industry? And third question, the models you've used, you quoted your, your publications, but I, I'm not knowledgeable in the topic. So I'm curious, what kind, would you say you would use, use like the first gen, second gen of, linear, of, of, or let's say machine learning models, or are you already in the territory of, let's say of these grand tools that have been developed by OpenAI and source? Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, to start with the first question, what uh, what we have shown, what is developed in house and what is outside. Most of the, uh, well, I would say at least the things what we have shown you, we are utilizing open source development. So we are not, uh, you know, buying any software from uh, from any vendor uh, because we feel that in this field there are. Um, at least in this in the scientific world, the community material science community have been, uh, you know, developing. Uh, such tools since last decades and we i am kind of strongly you know coming from that community so we utilize what is out there and i mean the high throughput simulations platform and everything we utilize that we modify and i am kind of you know building that for these applications uh, uh, in house now the second part i mean that question is very broad where is it bsf and bsf is so huge in terms of uh, their products and challenges uh, I think it is hard to, I mean, it's, I am not in a position to kind of say where we are as a general, but there is a, a enormous data awareness, increasing data awareness there, but it will, I think, I think that's, that's beyond the scope of this presentation and, and, and this context we are talking. Um, our data integration and data science communities are also also much larger than what I have you know talked about. There are other challenges of lab instrumentations uh, and other things which re which requires different approach. So we are not talking about that. Uh, and then the third question uh, is uh, about where we are uh, in terms of interatomic potential development and this you know quantum mechanical scale. Uh, I would say we are at the forefront. We work uh, that the models, uh, uh, what I showed you, you know, at, on the video. This is a close collaboration with uh, with uh, Cambridge, with uh, Professor Gabor Chani's group. Uh, we are about to write up this paper. I come from also this development background, so we are really kind of pushing the field, where uh, working on the really fundamental problems. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Let, let, let me maybe have a short comment, Piotr, also on on uh, on that part. I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Two years ago, or two and a half years ago, almost two and a half years ago, we went through an analysis uh, who, who's doing what in the field, in the chemical and processing industry uh, for the catalyst group. And the outcome was really, and I think that's more of an objective one that BSF is one of the leaders in uh, digitalization, whether it comes to uh, applicants in processes, uh, whether it comes to uses on site for uh, measuring business metrics, but also in R&D. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, it's a very fast moving field. So we have fast followers, basically, with, which who push through. So if we do this analysis now, I would, well, I would still say we are leading. 
Um, and and we are, I think we are leading for a good cause because we are very conscious about our sustainability goals and we also very openly communicate them and we we feel the urge basically to contribute to what we are doing here as as, as R and D so that we can really bring value. Mm -hmm. And and the second thing is of course that we also need to bring value to our customers. So we also basically utilize those tools basically to help our customers with the products and services that we that we develop and bring this forward. And I think the whole package is very unique uh, in the in the industry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you very much, the two of you. Are there any further questions from the audience? You want to ask Sadim and Stefan? So maybe because we are here at the KIT and I'm innovation manager, <laughs> of course, I'm thinking, and uh, I know quite well the Institute of uh, Professor Dietmeyer. I don't know if you know his name because I'm experimentator too. And I know that his technology of using micro channels, especially with coated catalysts, offers, uh, let's say it at the real production side in some way, because you can deal very much better with heat exchange and so on. Do you know him? Yes, of course. And, and ah. we are in touch uh, with the whole institute. So we are in touch with Professor Stapf and of course also with uh, uh, characters like uh, Olaf Deutschmann, Jan yeah. de Kronwald and, and, and Felix Stud. And these are also very joyful uh, corporations. I mean, uh, it's, it's public that we as PSF has, have a strong liaison with KIT, which we also enjoy in a number of, uh, of projects and so to say, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we will strengthen those ties in the foreseeable future for good reasons. So we are also together in NFDI for CUT as one of the core consortia for us with regards to catalysts and process development within the NFDI. So absolutely, and, and, and this needs to be strengthened those ties and we need to focus on the right things and that's that's the mm -hmm. main purpose for us and, and and the main mission for us yeah yes. what contributes uh, the largest value in terms of uh, making our verbund sites uh, greenhouse gas emission neutral as fast as yes. possible what what uh, enables energy savings for the verbund and where can we basically offer the right products for our customers that are sustainable yeah, and, and, and can be handled sustainably. I mean, these are the things that drive us, but I think we are very committed and, and we feel the same commitment of our partners, especially also at KIT, and, and we enjoy driving things forward. Of course, that's perfect. BESF is quite next door. So my task here at the KIT is technology transfer with funding from the Innovation Fund of the KIT itself. So I'm personally very happy that I met you and maybe we can make some, some new projects, thinking new ideas in the future. Hmm?